Is it on? Good morning. All right, so I had to restart my little laptop, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Just a couple things for today, a couple quick announcements. So we did have that quiz, did have that quiz on Friday. It's not syncing with Gradebook anymore and PowerSchool or with PowerSchool anymore. And PowerSchool wasn't working yet off all day yesterday. I don't know if it is today or not, but I'll try to get the grades in as soon as possible. It is really slow now. I don't know what happened. They made an update and so it made it even worse. And I'll come back to that. So I'm going to be on for just a second. And why don't we just wait a few minutes? Yes, I will be collecting this. And so I'm just going to so here I have teams and I am doing stuff about online yesterday I did notes I will collect notes again next week and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to assign it on Friday but it'll be the last notes all together one big lump unit because that's my plan I don't know it might be too much uh, you know, maybe I won't do that because then it'll be huge files. I keep on forgetting you have to take pictures and it limits the size of the team's limits of size. So we'll just do through Friday and then I'll sign it on Friday also just the first three days of next week. And that's when I quit. And one of those days will probably be stories. And so that is my plan for that day. Yeah, I don't know anything about uh, power school and that. Every day we seem to get something different. Uh, I know they're having all kinds of issues uh, with updates on power school and various things. Uh, <laughs> uh, doing that right now would be a tough job because everybody in the country seems to be having those issues. So um, being the person running the tech right now would be a tough, di tough gig. So. Um, that's the first thing about, uh, about grades. There will be a quiz on Friday and same deal. I'll make it due late in that or make it due next week or the week after. But I should remind you every assignment I have, I allow for late work. As I've said many times and posted many times, if you miss an assignment, uh, all this stuff comes at you at once. I know this is really hard for some people have, um, anything from spotty connections to all kinds of uh, stuff going on. I mean, this has been a difficult few months. And, you know, especially in the beginning when everything was just thrown at us and it was all brand new. So I allow late work. And so if you have missed something, go back in your assignments, you can turn something in late. The big thing is you have to let me know it's late. Now, one or two days late, like, um, or like the new front, uh, we did the Rage Within last week. And I made that do the worksheet of the video. I can get that pretty easily. I'm talking about stuff like a month ago or something. I will take it. Because I know how difficult these times are, but you have to let me know. So everything I've done, at least um, tried, you can turn in late work. So if you have to go back and turn something in, that includes uh, uh, examples of extra credit. But same deal. If you don't tell me, I will miss something. If you go back and do redo the extra credit for uh, the road to rock bottom and <laughs> you don't tell me, I will never see it. I won't go back and look that far. But if you tell me, I'll go back and I'll give you the credit. One more thing. I'm thinking about giving you one last little bit of extra credit more than anything else because I normally would have done it um, in the past, but we're all um, kind of discombobulated. I've allowed people to watch a movie for extra credit. And I'll give you the last week and a half to do it. So I'm thinking about doing that. And I will let you know tomorrow. I might just assign it tomorrow. But that'll be the last chance for extra credit. But don't forget, I'm allowing for late work. So you have to go back. And you might have to scroll back through the posts. I know there's a lot of posts. So scroll through carefully. You might miss something. But I've not taken anything down since the beginning. Uh, at least as far as I know. It's actually kind of shocking. This goes all the way back to your AP review sessions. I mean, you can go all the way back. I have not taken down. I've only taken out a couple like a little announcements that are not needed anymore, like message deleted. But here's notes, World War II, and here's my late work will be accepted to remind you again, I want to make sure. 
uh, gathering storm. I gave, I allowed for extra credit. There it is right there. And I said that very clearly as we were doing it and so on. Notes, tests, everything else. So it's all in there on the post. So please check. So let's go ahead then and get back to, to the Great Society. So yesterday talked about, oh, uh, the bonsai video. I originally was going to make that an assignment and then we just kind of ran out of time. So I didn't. So I talked about it, but I never did actually do that. And I know I put that on the calendar for bonsai and <laughs> bonsai is a plant. B-A-N-Z-I is the actual um, yell at the charge. But for, and then um, on our way. And so I did not do that. If uh, it's a great video, it's from the best. You know, the '50s video we watched the Rage Within, and I showed a bunch of clips. Um, called it's the, the documentary is called the '50s. Is one of the best documentaries. World at War, that Bonsai and Honor Way is from is the prototypical documentary. It's so good. And so I wasn't I wasn't going to assign that. I um, thought about making that extra credit, but I never did. If somebody did watch it and wants to turn that in, tell me, turn it in on, just send me a copy of it and I will give you some extra credit. It's a great video. If you watch it, it is so well done. That whole series. And if you got a little bit of free time, it's only 37 episodes. It used to be on Netflix and then they took it off. There's all kinds of money issues. I mean, this is like the prototypical documentary. And... So remind me about the movie. I'll send that out. Yeah, this is always a little touch and go. There's all, you know, I have ideas and then things don't work out on this. All right. So yesterday talked about the new frontier and that was Kennedy's program. New, the frontier. And the big thing was the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close the, the world was to nuclear war. And I even told you about the four times in one day, October 26th, that we almost went to nuclear war. Also, a few other things that happened during that time. Um, remember, this was the time of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And Kennedy tried everything, begged, begged Martin Luther King and other people not to do that march because he thought it would put him in a bad light. And they said, no, we're going to push him. By the way, that's how change happens. You have to push people. If you, if you allow the comfortable to remain comfortable, they're not going to change. And so they had to push. And talked about sit-ins, Freedom Riders, Birmingham, George Wallace, uh, and then Vietnam and the assassination of the Zem and how the Viet Cong was winning. And then Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. At least that's the way it looked. And then the whole thing about the Warren Commission because of the assassination of Oswald by a strip club owner named Jack Ruby who would die in, uh, from pancreatic cancer in prison seven, six years after that, um, always claiming he acted alone. So with that, let's get to the Great Society. And that's Lyndon Johnson's program. Lyndon Johnson, this Texan, rough-hewn, ridiculed because he was not from this Ivy League college and so many people, especially in Kennedy's administration, were these Ivy Leaguers. David Halberstam, the same guy who wrote the 50s, and he was interviewed in that video. He wrote a very famous book called The Best and the Brightest, talking about all these incredibly intelligent, you notice I put quotes around there, people with all these academic degrees coming into the Kennedy administration, and they looked down at Johnson, who had to work hard to get out of, and I'm not kidding, Johnson City, Texas, to go to Southwest Texas Teachers College, and they said, ah, he's an inferior, in, Inferior education, uh, educated, they looked at him as a rube and a bumpkin, which he was not. And a couple things about that. Johnson would turn out to be significantly smarter in virtually all of them, much more adept politically than any president in American history. And if you really think about it, nobody has screwed things up more for the country than Ivy League graduates. But that's another story. And so let's get back to this. The Great Society. Oh, almost forgot one more thing. Ernest Green, who was in the 50s series we watched, uh, The Rage Within, and he was one of the students who graduated from Little Rock Central High. 
chosen to use class as a way to divide the races again, just like Bacon's Rebellion. It's amazing how these names keep cycling around. But <coughs> Ernest Green just turned 78 today. And he was interviewed in that video. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting guy. And that's great that uh, I just happened to catch that. He's 78. Oh, I should almost add that the test ban treaty and hotline came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Khrushchev would be ousted, and that led to Leonid Brezhnev and the Soviet Union vowing to never be humiliated again because of the embarrassment of backing out of that. And Just a sec. Sorry, I'm having a little bit issue with this. Uh, give me a sec. I know this is exciting. Okay, so back to this. Yeah. So you get my little taskbar train on the bottom. I don't know how to get rid of that right now, and I gotta quit. I don't know what happened, why it's there. So let's talk very briefly about. Oh, almost forgot the limited test ban treaty. So I mentioned yesterday that the arms race seems to be picking up. It is being discussed in the Trump administration right now to begin open atmospheric testing. In fact, just 10 days ago, they seriously talked about it, but then they decided to table it thinking this will push China and Russia. And so it's kind of amazing how they're thinking about doing open atmospheric testing again. And uh, I don't know where they would do it. Um, my guess is nobody wants that, except for a small little uh, group of people within the administration right now. But it's pretty, pretty amazing how things loop around. So back to the Great Society. This. It, right, this picture right here is Lyndon Johnson. Well, first off, that's Lyndon Johnson on his ranch. And yes, Lyndon Johnson, LBJ, just like FDR, JFK. LBJ, his ranch was the, and I swear to you I'm not making this up, the LBJ ranch. There he is on a horse on the LBJ ranch right after he got, um, right after he got the nomination for president in 1964 to run again for re-election. Here he is at the University of Miss, uh, Michigan in 1964, giving the commencement address. That big thing in front of him, that is a, that's a speech scrolling in. Have you ever seen a teleprompter where they, if you look at any politician, anybody speaking at a podium, they'll have these clear looks at like glass um, things on either side of them and in front of them. They project the speech onto those glass frames. Now you can't see it through tell, um, you can't see it um, from behind. But people reading, um, people in front can read the speech as they go on. So you notice how people speak and they'll kind of go here, then look here. <laughs> They're looking at the teleprompter. Well, that's an early teleprompter right there. And in it, he laid out his vision to finish the New Deal, to finish. The great, or finish what he saw, what FDR started. In fact, he's going to outdo FDR and all those things of the new frontier that Kennedy couldn't get. Johnson's going to get them all and more. There has been nobody like uh, Lyndon Johnson on getting bills passed. Nobody. He used the great sympathy uh, um, in the country for him after he took office after the horrible murder of President Kennedy and used that to get bills passed, with the idea being, I will use it. He had immense political skill. And it was a three-pronged, three-pronged plan. And I want to be very clear about it. He started it, got a lot of bills passed. It did not, or he did not finish. It was partial. It was partial. And I'll explain why in a second. So first off, civil rights. And there's going to be a few elements of the Civil Rights Act, and I'll come back to these. I'm telling you about it now, but it's not like he went there and said, we will pass civil rights and then we'll pass this and then we'll pass this. Not only did he have to fight for these laws individually, 
but you have this little thing called a civil war in Vietnam going on, the Cold War, the actual civil rights movement that's happening right in front of them. These were all these massive events. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So the first major law and one of the most important laws in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the first major civil rights act passed that had any teeth to enforcement since 1873. And okay, there was a civil rights act in 1657, but that had no power to enforce. And it said no discrimination based upon race, ethnicity, religion, or sex. And you notice that last part, sex. And conservative Republicans, if, uh, mostly from the West, and the few, there was only a couple Republicans in the South at this time, and conservative Democrats put that into the bill as a poison pill. A poison pill in this context means an element of a bill that will kill the bill. They figured that nobody in Congress would vote for a bill that would say no discrimination based upon sex, meaning um, there could be no discrimination of women. This is what the whole thing was about, and implying that women have equal rights to men. Not quite, it's more complex than that, but that's what it meant. But liberal Democrats and Lyndon Johnson passed it, but especially pushed by Hubert Humphrey, senator from Minneapolis, a tireless fighter for equal rights, and the Senate Majority Leader who took over from Lyndon Johnson, Mike Mansfield of Montana. Montana back then had two of the most prominent uh, senators in the United States. Economically very liberal. Montana was a, a, a much more liberal state back then. Very union state. Um, work for, um, passed a lot of laws for working people. And Mike Mansfield and Lee Metcalf were two of the most prominent senators in American history. During this era, most of the wilderness acts and areas designated as wilderness areas would come about in the 1960s, part of the Great Society, and Lee Metcalf would push that, and that's why some of the biggest wilderness areas in Montana are named after Metcalf. But back to this. So this was passed, and here's Martin Luther King getting a pin from Lyndon Johnson. They would sign parts of the bill and give pins away. It's a very common thing. And... So weird seeing people shake hands and being around each other. I wonder why today. A Massey bill. This got rid of most Jim Crow laws. There were issues about private clubs and private facilities. Um, and those weren't ever really addressed completely um, to this day. But for the most part, Jim Crow died here. And that meant that everybody technically under the protection of the federal government can participate in the day-to-day -day activities of commerce. And that was why Jim Crow was such a big deal. Um, one of the defenses of Jim Crow laws are people who would say, well, I own the business. Shouldn't I um, have the right to choose who I serve? You know, no, no shirts, no shoes, or service. Why couldn't I? If I don't want to serve one person, why do I have to serve them? And there's an element of that that fits in with private industry. If someone's causing trouble, you don't have to serve them. But if you exclude somebody based upon no action they did, but of who they are, AKA the color of their skin, if you exclude them, that means you're telling everybody that a certain group in society cannot participate in the day-to-day -day activities of the United States economy of commerce. That means by definition, you are saying a certain group of people are at a lower state. So it's more than just simply saying, well, I'm not going to serve you in my restaurant. I'm not going to cut your hair or make you a cake. What it means is, is that those people have by no action of theirs are not allowed to prosper. And so you are committing them to a permanent second class status. So big law. The Civil Rights Act. Next, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we'll come back to this because this was a massive political issue that would in many ways contribute to Vietnam because the Civil Rights Act never actually dealt with the voting issues in the South. And what it said is this, it got rid of the literacy test completely. Now literacy test was basically technically banned in 1819 as part of the grandfather's clause, but the literacy test 
remain for all voters if you um, had to take this literacy test, and it was specifically designed not to pass. It also completely ended the grandfather's clause. And lastly, the Immigration Act of 1965. That got rid of the National Origins Act um, of 1924, opening up more immigration from places outside of this tiny little area of Western and Northern Europe. And so you're gonna get a lot more immigrants, especially immigrants from Latin and South America, who the United States had been bringing in since the 1930s as almost slave laborers, as indentured servants. And this would change that to allow for more immigration, but as the economy changed in Latin America, especially because of US economic domination, especially with something called NAFTA, you're gonna see a lot of people coming in undocumented. There would also be a Fair Housing Act in 1968 that would somewhat redress, um, I thought I'd put that in there. Fair Housing Act of 1968, just imagine I put that in there. I'm gonna type it in right now because I do not wanna forget. I, I really thought I'd put that in there. It did not do as much, huh? Well, I'm not gonna put it in there. All right, another technical issue. That is so weird. Things just happen weird. So the Fair Housing Act would say at least somewhat limit the discrimination based upon race that happened in housing, which was endemic in housing. This is a massive issue. And Johnson did everything he could to get this passed earlier. It was not as big as they would have liked. Um, the, our current president was actually um, convicted twice and paid million dollar fines because of violation of the Fair Housing Act by not allowing African Americans into his apartments. And so once again, well, he's been around a long time. That gets back to our current president. So with that, why aren't you working? There we go. So here we are, back to this. Part B, a war on poverty. And the poverty rate was still well over 20% beside, despite having a massive economic expansion and the Great Compression. And so Johnson was going to start a little bit what Kennedy started, but then to end the scourge of poverty with long lasting goals. But he never quite finished these. All of these laws, also called the safety net, were were not complete, not as complete as it could be. He thought he could pass the laws and improve them later. This little thing about Vietnam would get in the way. So first off, part of the old, uh, of the second Agricultural Adjustment Act were called food stamps. So they expanded food stamps. Now it's also sometimes called SNAP or um, supplemental, supplemental, I did that, supplemental nu nutrition assistance program. And these are to help people below a certain income level. It's tiny about a thousand, a little over a thousand dollars a year per person, but still a little bit of help for people. Originally designed to help keep farm prices up now, it is more of a program to help those in need. Uh, Education Act, the first public aid, government aid for education. The vast majority of, gov of money for education still comes from local governments. And that's why there's such huge differences because richer areas, um, since they fund most of the schools have just, they put more money in the schools than poor areas but at least a little bit of federal government aid. This is also where you get things like uh, Pell Grants and student loans. Johnson wanted free tuition too, and tuition was so low, this was gonna be a band-aid till they could get that, but it never happened. So actually, it, he wanted it, uh, thought they would get it, never happened. Head Start was going to be daycare for people below a certain income level, so it would be means tested. There's flaws with mean testing, that's another story. Medicare would be health care for the elderly, so health insurance for the elderly, which is by far the most expensive. And Medicare, along with Social Security, has um, pulled many people out of poverty. By the way, um, the current president and the conservative Republicans have always tried to cut Medicare, but it's still very popular. Medicaid is health care for the for poor, but every state has a different program, so Montana. The state pays and the federal government pays. So it's a really much more of a hodgepodge, which is another compromise bill they thought they would fix later. And that just gives you an example of how it's just incredibly complex U.S. healthcare system. There's also aid to families with dependent children, which actually came out of the New Deal. 
and this was what people called welfare. So it'd be a little bit of income, money, direct money to people. So income supplement um, for people under the poverty line. Under President Clinton, they got rid of this, and now we have we have virtually no direct aid for people. And that's one of the reasons why this uh, pandemic has been such an economic catastrophe for people. We have virtually no direct aid. And so if they don't have a job, uh, it's hard to get health care. Um, you have to go through this elaborate process to apply for Medicaid, for food stamps. It's a big issue. But the big thing about the war on poverty, there would be over a thousand laws passed. Some good, some not. I just gave you examples of some. But the big thing was the poverty rate was cut by... Uh, almost 70% by the end of the decade. It worked better than anyone thought. But I should add, this goes completely against conservative economics. And conservative presidents, and we've had basically economically conservative presidents since Nixon. We've had Nixon, Ford. <laughs> uh, Carter was pretty conservative. A little more liberal um, than Reagan was very conservative. George H.W. Bush was very conservative. Clinton was pretty conservative. Uh, Bush was conservative, Obama economically was conservative, and probably the most conservative president since Coolidge and, Har and Hoover, Trump. They've cut these programs and poverty now is, is edging up to where it was before the war on poverty. And this goes against conservative economics, and they'll try to undermine this. This is why conservatives, if you're a true conservative, you don't like things like Social Security or Medicare, Medicare because this raises wages. By making people more secure, with things like economic support and knowing they have some kind of backstop in bad times, they will demand higher wages. So that's the war on poverty. Here's Johnson in West Virginia, known for its high poverty rate. There's the announcement of Head Start right there is Lyndon Johnson's wife. Yes, her name was Lady Bird Johnson. Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, LBJ. His daughters were Linda Burr Johnson and Lucy Baines Johnson. So, next cultural growth. He wanted to expand and make the United States into something more than just simply, or um, he wanted to expand more than just simply selling goods to the lowest common denominator. One of the problems with art and media, if it's purely for profit, they will try to Market it to the lowest common denominator to sell as much as possible. If you don't believe me, watch television, watch most shows. Heck, watch Netflix. Netflix. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so I, I do get Netflix. And when they first started making their own shows, some are really good. It's actually kind of shocking to me. I'm not saying they're like, okay, let me rephrase that. They were good. <laughs> and now they're all the same because now they're just, okay, this is what people like. Let's just throw out as many of these things as possible. And the quality drops because they try to sell as much as possible. The reason why they want to profit. And so Johnson wanted to use taxpayer money for cultural growth. And so part of that would be, okay, I mentioned student loans before, but a college and well-educated people should be more schooling, should be more than just simply getting a job. It is to become a good citizen and it is to become a thinking citizen. And that is why they want to promote college. Next, uh, also promote the arts. For example, a couple, uh, few things that will come out of this. Um, public television would originally be a pretty highly funded uh, program for uh, government aid for a network that could do more than just simply marketing shows to sell as much advertising as possible. And one of the most famous examples would be Sesame Street. And I can remember when Sesame Street, I, re I remember when PBS first came to Montana and I watched Sesame Street. A lot of you probably watched it, but other shows like this that were marketed, um, the whole idea would be they would not be to be marketed to sell goods like toothpaste. They would be marketed for quality program, artistic programs. During the Nixon administration, they cut back funding so much now that pu the public, public money, meaning taxpayer money, only uh, funds a tiny percentage. And I think there's been a qualitative issue with that. Uh, also, National Public Radio, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, etc. So, I want to put it this way. Johnson had huge goals. And he was able to get this passed with what everybody called the Johnson treatment. And Johnson had this way to beg, plead, conjole, threaten, you name it. And he had no issues about personal space. He was this big, hulking man. 
and you can just see the pictures of them with these big ears and big nose, and that's something I'm just warning you about. As you get older, your nose gets bigger, your ears get bigger. You might not grow any taller, but those things keep growing. I would argue it's unfair, but he would get in their face and get right up to them and plead and stare. And these are great examples of Johnson doing this. He just had this ability to convince people. But there's more than this. You cannot believe what Johnson would do to get this passed. And he would be earthy. He would make crude jokes. He would swear. Sometimes his southern, he would become, um, his southern accent would come out even more than ever before. I mean, Johnson was a pretty interesting guy. But here he is uh, <coughs> howling with his dog in the Oval Office. And every little kid who would come into the White House Johnson would give them a bushel basket full of beagles, which a lot of people were really surprised by this. A whole bushel, I'm joking. No, they just happened to be a kid looking at um, these beagles. And that is one of his two beagles. Johnson's beagles, he named them, and I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Anybody want to guess? Any guesses? See, I'm, I'm talking to no one. I got a wall and then a camera. But little beagle Johnson won. Little Beagle Johnson too. Those were his beagles. Yes, he would be uh, accused of animal cruelty when he held up his beagle like this. And he thought it must be some communist plot to get him and claimed that beagles like to be held like that. Moving on. So in 1964, Johnson won to win election, to win this election on his own merit. He had to get out of the shadow of Kennedy because a lot of people saw him as an accidental president, even though his popularity was shockingly high. But he also knew a part of the reason it was high is because he was Kennedy's vice president. And so he wanted to win a smashing victory with his great society. And so here is Johnson with his running mate. He picked Hubert Horatio Humphrey, the guy who was so instrumental in pushing through the Civil Rights Act of Minnesota. And Humphrey, I do have mixed feelings about him, but um, um, some things he would do um, a little bit later on, I think for the most part, a very good man. Here is Humphrey and Johnson. By the way, Humphrey would, would always be opposed to the Vietnam War, but couldn't say anything because he was Johnson's vice president. I love scientists, engineers, and physicians for Johnson Humphrey. And what was their program? Their program was the Great Society. The Great Society will make this country better, and we're winning the Cold War. You have nothing to fear. A conservative insurgency had been growing in the Republican Party for years. Anger over electing or nominating so-called liberal Republicans like Dewey, Eisenhower, and even Nixon, who was not that, who was pretty conservative. And this insurgency... Um, through organization and planning, did something pretty amazing. They won the nomination in 1964. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of issue. Okay, here we go. And I moved myself. See, I can fly around here. I like showing me because then you know I'm actually here. You feel like you're part of me. But you can see my hand movements have no purpose. Barry, excuse me, Barry Goldwater, the senator from Arizona, was a conservative icon. And he would run, the run for the nomination and nobody thought he would win. Nelson Rockefeller, the more liberal governor, Republican governor of... Okay, I just saw me, I'm about three seconds behind on my little monitor for YouTube. And I just saw me fly over, so it was kind of funny. All right, so, everyone thought it would be Nelson Rockefeller. But Barry Goldwater's organization and this growing underground conservative movement that virtually everybody outside of that movement underestimated. And boy, were they, um, those who underestimated, boy, were they surprised. Because Goldwater would sneak in and win the nomination. And he was a rabid Cold Warrior. A, talked freely about nuclear war. And said that liberal Republicans were nothing but an Where's my mouth? There we go. An echo. Still running? All right, good. Just an echo. 
and not an echo of Democrats. And so with that, Barry Goldwater would run and he would be a real option, they thought, a conservative option. There's too much government. We're helping the poor too much. If you fail, it's your own responsibility. And if North Vietnam wants to help the South, uh, help the Viet Cong, we will turn North Vietnam into a glowing parking lot. And he talked rather casually about dropping atomic bombs, and this is what he said, in the bathroom of the Kremlin. So he freely talked about nuclear war. In fact, that's really all Goldwater cared about. He loved war. But what got his popularity was what they dubbed and would become the Republican strategy from then on, the Southern strategy. And it was to take advantage of white anger in the South over the Civil Rights Bill and hammer LBJ and the Democrats as the party that's giving equal rights. And here is a poster for Barry Goldwater and liberal, it says LBJ, Civil Rights Bill and you. And here is a black man hired and a white man fired. And that's 1964. Blatantly racist, but shockingly effective. Shockingly effective. Now, Goldwater was against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, basically because he believed you can't force businesses to do anything they don't want to do. And he was uncomfortable talking about the race issue because he personally didn't see it that way. Goldwater really was a pretty narrow a, a, a guy. Narrow mind is not the right word. He had blinders on. He, he just he didn't see it the way that the reality was of Jim Crow law. He was incredibly isolated in Arizona. He just wanted to talk about jet fighter planes. And that I'm not making up. He loved talking about the F-4 Phantom. But when he, ever he would talk about opposition to the Civil Rights Bill, people went nuts. They just went nuts and cheered. And that's what's got him, that's what got him the nomination. And they all remembered how angry um, Southern Democrats were in 48 when they left over Truman's support of civil rights and anger over JFK for supporting lukewarm civil rights. But now you have the civil rights president, Lyndon Johnson, who ironically was a Southern Texan who was not known as a friend of civil rights. <sighs> Time's complex. By the way, Goldwater, yep, AUH2O, ha <laughs> ha, little chemistry for you. So, oh, I'm I, anti-civil rights, anti-commie. I forgot one more thing. He really pushed this values issue, that liberal values of talking about blacks having equal rights, but also women having equal rights and other changes. We're going to turn the United States into this hotbed of sin and vice. And it was always underlined in the Southern strategy was, if you allow blacks to have rights, you know what blacks do. And okay, when I say that, and you might be thinking, wow, what a terrible thing to say. I hope lights come on. Isn't this exactly the argument for slavery? If you don't have slavery, what will those savages do unless they're controlled? They will either be impoverished and die, or they'll commit horrific crimes or vice. So this was used so effectively. And boy, what music was popular? Hmm. So this is the beginning of what we'll call the culture war. Now the culture war was already rumbling, but the culture war of conservative values, of true American values, knowing that this will appeal to people who economically might be benefited by Johnson's programs, but fearful of value issues of music and the generation gap turning teenagers into drug addicts and sex fiends, or blacks getting equal rights and disrupting society, or women demanding equal rights. And this culture war is essentially a conservative argument, and this should remind you of the 1920s. And so, they were, and I put this in italics, his economic program was essentially anti-New Deal, anti-Union. But they didn't push that as much. What did they push? Blacks getting equal rights. America is falling apart because of these liberal values and the commies are winning. But it was to destroy the New Deal and he wanted to get rid of Social Security and was not going to allow Medicare. Well, Lyndon Johnson knew, Lyndon Johnson knew that Goldwater was so extreme 
so extreme. Remember what I told you about his anti-commie feelings. He was so extreme that people would be fearful of nuclear war. We just had the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so if he could play jo uh, Goldwater off as a crazy warmonger, and here's Johnson playing the middle road. He's tough on communism. The communists aren't going to win, but he's not going to blow off blow up the world. And by the way, I should add that Goldwater made it easy for him. Goldwater, you know, we'll blow up the bathroom of the Kremlin. Wow. So in 1964, we have what's called the Tonkin Golf Incident. And now it's a two-part incident. August 2nd, 1964. So this is actually just before the Democratic National Convention where Johnson is going to stride in and win a glorious nomination. Well, the Viet Cong was winning in South Vietnam. North Vietnam was helping them through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, just as the United States was helping the South Vietnamese government. South Vietnamese commandos were attacking bases in North Vietnam secretly to try to cut off the flow of supplies to the Viet Cong. Now, you might wonder, how did the South Vietnamese get up there? Well, the U.S. Navy. Secretly, the United States Navy was ferrying them up there to attack these bases. They had limited effect. They didn't really work that well. But sometimes U.S. ships would actually shell, all in secret, North Vietnamese bases. So the U.S. was secretly more involved than anybody knew. Johnson knew about it, but the whole thought was, if we could just do a couple pinpricks, pinpricks, maybe North Vietnam will quit and we can win and win there. And so with that, on August, there was an attack right here. On the, um, where are we at here? There was an attack here with commandos on the 31st. U.S. ships were involved. U.S. ships were still there on the 2nd. And the thought was, by the North Vietnamese, there must be another commando attack. And local North Vietnamese officers ordered torpedo boats, which are small, uh, fast boats that fire torpedoes at ships. Um, John Kennedy was, was um, the commander of a torpedo boat called PT-109, the one I told you about that got sunk earlier. They attacked the Maddox. Um, didn't um, do much damage, but there were shell holes in it. The Maddox fired back, and U.S. ships were fired technically outside of the, um, or outside of North Vietnamese waters into international waters. Now, Johnson was told um, by many of his advisors, hey, this is opportunity now. Let's strike back in North Vietnam to prove you're tough on communism. But Johnson realized, and others realized, that if we attack here, it will be tied to those commando attacks, these commando attacks, and we will look like that we have been lying and <coughs> we have been lying about what we have been doing in North Vietnam or South Vietnam and look like we're escalating and that will ruin everything. So two days later, the Maddox and another ship, the Turner Joy, came back and they're gonna go and patrol the same area here, hoping to get another attack. And this time two aircraft carriers were there to retaliate if that happens. No commando attacks in a few days, so the U.S. could say, we're just on a routine patrol, which is pretty provocative to have warships sail right off shore in sight of North Vietnam, but that's another story. So the Turner Joy, by the way, the, this is a real picture of the North Vietnamese torpedo boats. Just a sec. Relax for a sec. I thought I saw a bird on our bird feeder. Occasionally, a woodpecker, a downy woodpecker, will come and land on our bird feeder. I know. And I was hoping it was that. It was not that. It was not that. <laughs> but back to this. Two days later. So these two ships went, and immediately both the Turner Joy and the Maddox reported that there were torpedoes, boats attacking them. There were torpedoes in the water. Oh, my picture's blocking it. Ah, sorry about that. I forgot I moved my mug. So, 
We'll go back. You can look that real fast. Anti-New Deal. Okay, vulture, uh, the culture war. <laughs> yeah. Good times. All right, so. They reported torpedoes in the water. We're under attack. They're all get, um one, two, three, 20, 30 torpedoes in the water. Um, they're firing back. In fact, it was so confusing that the Turner Joy nearly fired on the Maddox. A former teacher at Capitol actually was on to Turner Joy at this time. And he told me a little bit about this. He also said that, yeah, he was involved with shelling illegally North Vietnam. And this very few people outside of a tiny group in the Pentagon knew this. Johnson didn't even know the extent of this. So let's get back to this. So LBJ was told they attacked. And this time he said retaliation. And the United States would use planes from the two aircraft carriers and bomb North Vietnamese bases. Two planes would be shot down. The first POW, prisoner of war, captured by North Vietnam, would be taken there and there. And remember, the United States has not declared war. Technically, this was violating international law. The United States was. This was always a big issue this whole time that the United States was violating the law. And so technically, the pilots who bombed North Vietnam were war criminals, terrorists. It, uh, yeah, I think you can read the, the problem with this. And so he ordered this retaliation. It came back from the time that Johnson ordered the retaliation to the planes actually launched. A few little things. Basically, it was this. Um, the two ships started sending, so eventually from, to the Philippines and Hawaii, then to Washington, D.C., that maybe there weren't so many torpedoes. Maybe they weren't, there weren't so many torpedo boats. Maybe we're not actually under attack and we have over-anxious radar operators. And there were doubts that the attack ever happened. But Johnson and his Secretary of, of Defense, Robert McNamara, or sorry, Johnson was never told. His Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, kept that secret. Because McNamara wanted this attack. The thought was, if North Vietnam knows we mean business, they'll quit. We totally underestimate the North Vietnamese, who wanted what most Vietnamese wanted. One Vietnam. And Johnson was never told. As it turned out, the second attack never happened. It never happened. But Johnson, ready for this. This shows, he didn't blow the world up, but he's tough on communists. They did strikes. So they're not going to let the commies push us around. And they would ask Congress just a few days afterwards with what's called the Tonkin Golf Resolution. August 1964. And what this was was a blank check. It said the president can do anything the president wants to stop aggression in Southeast Asia. And so Johnson could look tough. See, look at what it does. He could say, look how tough I am against the communists. And then at the same time, turn around and say, but I'm not a lunatic like Goldwater wants to blow the world up. This would be Johnson's justification for war. And it was totally built on lies because that attack never happened. It passed unanimously in the House of Representatives and all but two members of the Senate voted against it. And with years, it would be clear that it was not true. And now we know for a fact it did not happen. But let's add one thing really quick to this. This had happened before, hasn't it? We went to war in Mexico by claiming that the Mexicans attacked U.S. dragoons north of the Rio Grande. To this day, we don't know where. But President Polk told Congress, we know that happened. We knew that happened. The United States went to war against Spain, saying, we know Spain blew up the Maine. No, that didn't happen. Here it happened again, and it will happen in your lifetime. Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Congress would give a blank check for the president to do whatever he wants, and the United States would invade Iraq, and 600,000 people would die. And so because of that, that is where we get, um, well, you could see the beginning of the distrust of government. Why did Johnson do this? Because he wanted to be reelected to get Vietnam, or to get the Great Society passed. And then Johnson could play the peacemaker. And in it, he is going to run, arguably, one of the most successful 
commercials in American history. Let me make sure I have sound here. So I know you want to see this commercial. So the most successful commercial in American history. What is this? Why is this here? Here we go. No way! I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. I didn't know this was here. Everybody likes I for president. You're welcome. You are so welcome. All right. So all the way with LBJ, he can play the moderate, the most famous political ad in history. What happened? It's called the Daisy ad. And what the Daisy ad was this. It only played once. The most popular show on television at that time was NBC, the Sunday night movie of the week. So they played feature link motion pictures that people couldn't see if it was out of the theater. And so this was the most watched. They showed it once. But then they knew that television broadcasts would hit. Well, so while Goldwater's ads were basically anti-civil rights and, oh no, young kids are going to destroy the world. There's a lot. This has been a common theme. Kids are out of control. You millennials, you know, that kind of thing. But anyways, I don't know what you are. I'm just making stuff up. People talked about this ad because it played on everybody's fear. And it's subtle. I think you will understand why it was such a... a Powerful ad. Where's my mouse? It's kind of cute, yeah. Two, yes. three, four, five, seven, six, six. Different. Subtle. These are the stakes. That's Johnson. To make a world in which all of God's children can live, or to go into the dark. We must either love each other, or we must die. Wow. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Wow, what an ad! So subtle. The stakes are too high. Played on everybody's fear. What an incredibly good ad. This worked exactly the way they wanted. It laid out that Goldwater was the warmonger. And a lot of people said, how could Johnson do this? This is unfair. Well, Goldwater was a warmonger. And so Lyndon Johnson could play the moderate. And so therefore he could push back um, all the issues of the Cold War. And now with the Tonkin Gough resolution, nobody was talking about South Vietnam. So even though they were worried every single day that the South Vietnamese government, wanted, and this was the government under General Big Men, that it might collapse at any moment, they just were pushed that out of the way and Johnson would win the biggest landslide in history. The biggest popular vote vi his, uh, victory in American history, beating by a little tiny, a, while, a tiny bit, uh, FDR in 36. And look at the states, overwhelming for Johnson. Now, Arizona, that's where Barry Goldwater was from. But do you see the Southern strategy? There was no, basically no Republican party in these states. And yet Goldwater won them because of civil rights. And you're going to see the beginnings of the Southern strategy. And the next Republican nominee, Richard Nixon, will masterfully use that. And the Republican Party will become the party against equal rights. And how would they proclaim it? They should remind you of the term is states' rights. Isn't that familiar? Isn't that exactly the term that would be used for 1948 for the States' Rights Party and the Dixiecrats, and oh, also to defense of slavery in the, in the 1850s. It's the irony of the party of Lincoln would become this, but party shift. The Democrats were all over the place in the 1850s, but more, were more pro-slavery, and then they would become the party of civil rights. And African-American voters were about 65% voting Democratic after FDR, 
would go over 90% to this day, voting Democratic. And so Lyndon Johnson is president. And while this is happening, South Vietnam was literally falling apart, literally falling apart. Like I said, they were able to tamp it down, but then things exploded in 1965. In fact, right after the inauguration, there was a vicious Viet Cong attack on an air base in Pleiku, where the Americans had been using this base in South Vietnam uh, for medium bombers and transport planes to attack the Viet Cong. Here is Under Secretary of Defense Mick George Bundy. Yes, his name was Mick George, with the head of um, U.S. Assistant Command General Westmoreland, and uh, 30 Americans were killed in this attack, over 100 wounded. This brutal attack, and it showed that the Viet Cong were actually winning, and South Vietnamese government was just barely holding on. And it's coming to a time that if the U.S. wants South Vietnam to survive, it's going to have to send in troops or there will be one Vietnam. And Johnson, who kept Vietnam out of people's minds all through the election, especially after Tonkin Gulf, Johnson would make the very famous statement that he didn't want people to talk about Vietnam. Vietnam is something you want to hide. And he said, hey, if your, mother, if your mother-in-law has uh, one eyeball and it's the middle of, your fore, uh, middle of her forehead, you don't keep her in the living room. Okay, I'll let you ponder what that means. But basically what it means is you hide her, just like you hide Vietnam. And so with that, ironically, at the same time, nothing happens in a vacuum. <coughs> the Civil Rights Act never dealt with voting. And people wanted to vote. They wanted the right to vote, which actually came up in a big deal in 1964. And so the first Selma to Montgomery march for voting rights began, and they were brutally attacked by the, by the Alabama state police and armed thugs. Brutally attacked. And there's King and Walter Aper Abernathy marching right there. And this is actually the second march. And there, why did they do this? to push LBJ to act. LBJ is like, I just got the Civil Rights Act. Give me a year. And they said, no, just like the March on Washington. You promised, and now you have to deliver. And once again, that's how change happens. So you have Vietnam voting rights. And Johnson, who wants voting rights, but he also knows if he looks soft on communism, he can't get voting rights. Blowing up at the same time. Faithful decisions will be made that will forever change the world. And poor Vietnam. And here are counter protesters. And by the way, do you see it? The Confederate battle flag is going to come out all over. And what did the Confederate battle flag mean? It wasn't some um, garbage about history or even the lost cause myth. That's garbage. It was anti civil rights. Everybody knew that those who hold this flag are making a statement. They're making a political statement that I'm opposed to Americans, all Americans having equal rights. And there might be lots of reasons why they do it. And part of it could be ignorance, but that's what it means. And on that happy note, let's quit. So I will finish this up uh, tomorrow. I am fascinated by this. This is it's one of my, it's, it's really difficult. You know, the, the era before the Civil War, it just amazes me. You know, the Great Depression, World War II, oh, incredible eras, but the 60s, wow. What a time. Maybe because I'm a, I was alive in the 60s, but that's another story. And don't forget, makeup, all that kind of stuff. You can do it. I, um, yeah, uh, August asked about bonsai and on our way. And so, yes, I will. It's on my webpage. If you fill out that worksheet and give it to me, I'll give you extra credit. What the heck? And there are other examples of late work, and there's extra credit in there. And so you can do that. I've assigned that in the past. One thing about extra credit, I'm not going to go back and, and hand feed you, but I will take it. And then I will, uh, bah, 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 I think I might give you that movie. If enough people go and ask me, yeah, I would like to do a movie for extra credit, I'll do it. All right, then on that note, uh, where are we at here? All right, if there's no more questions, 
I would like you to have a great day. It's beautiful outside. Oh, uh, the wind's picking up, of course. All right. So I will talk to you later.